So good evening and a very and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, edition of uh, the Munich Economic Debates. My name is Clemens Fust, and we are organizing this jointly from IFO Institute uh, and Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, now, as you may know, the Munich Economic Debates are, as it were, a series of a series of lectures, and um, the, this lecture is part of a series uh, entitled The New World Order or Disorder, uh, How Business and Politics Can Build a Post-Pandemic New Normal. So it's, you know, we are, what we're trying to do is discuss uh, what the world will look like and what needs to be done for the time after the corona crisis, a time that will hopefully come soon. Um, uh, now, uh, a lecture series about the future world order, uh, the political order, the economic order, uh, and Europe's place in it, uh, which is, of course, our main concern, uh, I believe can have no better speaker than tonight's speaker. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Federica Mogherini, uh, uh, who will speak to us tonight. Uh, many of you know her, but let me still uh, introduce her. Feder Federica Mogherini is rector of the College of Europe in Bruges since September 2020. She also co-chairs the United Nations high-level panel on internal displacement. Uh, previously, she served as high representative of the EU for foreign affairs and security policy, and uh, she was vice president of the European Commission from 2014 to 2019. Before joining the EU, she was Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and a member uh, of the Italian Parliament. She has many more functions. She's a fellow of the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group and a fellow of the German uh, Marshall Fund, uh, among many other things. Uh, so, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a big honor and a pleasure to have you here. We are very much looking forward uh, to your talk. Um, the idea is that you will speak for some time, maybe 20 minutes or, or whatever it um, it is, and we will then have uh, a discussion. And I, I already have many questions, but I'm sure uh, the audience uh, does so as well. Um, so if you want to ask questions uh, later, please type them into the Q&A. Um, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, again, a very warm welcome. It's great you're here. The subject of your talk is foreign and security policy after COVID-19, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this prestigious uh, uh, series of talks. Uh, uh, the only regret is that uh, uh, it's virtual, uh, but uh, on the other side, it makes it easier uh, to attend to many different events and also uh, the participation. I'm, I'm really honored and pleased uh, uh, to, to join you tonight uh, and looking forward to what I am sure will be an extremely exciting and interesting conversation. Uh, I'm sure that I will learn as much as I will share uh, in, uh, uh, in the conversation that will follow my, my initial words. Uh, well, first of all, um, let me say that uh, um, if we look at the uh, uh, new normal uh, after uh, the COVID crisis, uh, uh, I think it is uh, indeed appropriate to define it this way because uh, um, I think we all know by now that uh, um, it will not be simply uh, going back to what was there before. Uh, I think that somehow um, the, the world and Europe uh, and each of our countries in Europe, our societies have known a deep change, even the way in which we work um, in any sector of society, in economy, in business, uh, in institutions, in politics, in, in academia, uh, everything has changed. And I think that there are some changes that will remain for sure, uh, even when uh, um, some in-presence activity uh, will uh, and some travels will be allowed again and will be safe again. Um, why so? Well, first of all, because uh, I think that this uh, um, this big uh, trauma that the world has lived now for one year, almost exactly one year, uh, because uh, uh, well, if you if we look at Europe, uh, it was uh, exactly in the end of February that mid February and of February that uh, the first cases were reported in Italy. Um, so exactly one year ago, uh, but in this uh, in this year, uh, we have uh, I think known. Uh, um, an overlapping of uh, different factors that uh, made us speak of uh, a change of era somehow. Um, and I think this is uh, an element uh, of factors that uh, 
do not add to each other, but actually multiply each other. Uh, obviously, that's the impact of the pandemic, and I'll, uh, I'll say something about that in a moment, and on how this can change um, foreign policy and international relations globally, the lo global landscape. But then uh, a few months afterwards, uh, there was also another big, uh, somehow, uh, global event that uh, has an impact on how international relations and global politics uh, uh, can look like in the months and years to come, and that is the American elections that for sure has shifted uh, the, the paradigm of uh, what we had known in the last four years uh, very significantly. So there's uh, uh, this two uh, um, major events, uh, obviously of completely different nature, uh, in, uh, uh, in this time span of a few months, I think, uh, uh, create an environment that uh, for sure will determine uh, a landscape uh, of global relations, of international relations, that will definitely not look like before uh, anymore, uh, never somehow. So there is first element I would share with you is that I strongly believe there is no going back to normal uh, possible. Um, and this could be seen as something um, scary, uh, even dangerous uh, for some aspects, uh, but this could also be seen as uh, as an opportunity for, for some other aspects. I've learned over time that uh, there is a fundamental um, difference between us Europeans and uh, our American friends. Uh, when you say uh, anything is possible in Europe, uh, this is normally um, a threat. <laughs> in the United States, is normally a promising thing. So um, I think that here, and, and, and for sure, if you have a uh, if you have a German background, uh, uh, you can refer to many philosophical um, writings uh, uh, to justify this uh, change of this, this different attitude. But uh, leaving philosophy apart, um, I think that um, I'll say a few words on, on how COVID, I believe, impacts uh, and, and can impact in the future uh, the state of relations in the world and also how Europe relates to the rest of the world and to all its own citizens and member states. Uh, and also maybe say a few words uh, uh, also on, uh, um, on the new transatlantic relations and, uh, uh, and, and the impact that the Biden administration will have on, uh, on the post-COVID time, because uh, um, again, even if it's two completely different uh, phenomenon, uh, obviously uh, there, is a, uh, there is a link in time and maybe also consequentiality uh, in, uh, in content. Uh, because probably uh, without uh, uh, the way in which the previous administration has handled COVID, uh, maybe Biden wouldn't have been elected president. So th there is also an element of cause effect uh, to be seen and to be, to be considered. COVID, um, I think in the beginning, uh, first of all, offered to all of us um, the clarity of view uh, of two basic elements that uh, I think in Europe we all knew, but uh, not everybody was uh, perfectly clear on them. The first element was the uh, interconnection, the interdependence uh, that we live in, a, in, in, the, in the world, in the, on the global scene. This is something that actually has been repeated time and again over the last at least three decades. I think I've grown up uh, in the era of, uh, uh, of, of global uh, interaction and interdependence. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I was in, in high school uh, in the year of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, that was the time when uh, globalization was actually growing and uh, the mantra of the time was uh, uh, the world is one and whatever happens in one place uh, has an impact on another place, no matter where you are. But even if we had repeated this for decades, I think we really understood and felt this, even on a private level, uh, only last year with the pandemic. I think it was the first real time, maybe um, maybe after the financial crisis uh, of, uh, of some years ago, but this was probably the first time, the very first time, that every single citizen of the world felt and understood that unless and until everybody uh, is safe uh, from COVID, himself or herself would have been still exposed. Uh, and so this, this element of interconnection, of being one, I think has come uh, self-evident for the first time in human history uh, with such a, a violent impact, I would say, on our psychologists. Um, the other element that I think COVID could have uh, highlighted in the beginning, uh, but then it turned into a different story, uh, unfortunately, this is at least my opinion, is the fact that, uh, well, in front of a global um, of a global threat, um, as uh, as the pandemic or as uh, the effects of climate change, it it would have been 
um, obvious, uh, maybe too obvious, uh, to actually happen um, to join forces. Uh, and in, if you remember, in the first weeks of the pandemic, uh, the, the natural um, inclination, uh, with some exceptions, but the natural overall inclination was, uh, was a push to join forces and try to, uh, to find either scientific or medical uh, solutions. Then this, uh, in, because clearly, if you have a global challenge, uh, you, you cannot have but a global solution, and a global solution cannot come if we don't join forces globally. That's, uh, that's again, uh, so elementary that uh, it, it might be too obvious or might seem too obvious to actually happen. And in fact, it didn't happen, because it immediately turned into a competition of narratives, first and foremost. Again, I can, uh, I can share my personal um, uh, national background impression, and, and I have lived those months, and I've lived all the time of the pandemic uh, as an Italian looking at the Italian news and uh, living in Belgium, uh, and now in Bruges, uh, looking at the Belgian news, and sometimes I had the feeling of looking into dif two different words. Uh, but uh, in, you might remember in the first weeks of the pandemic in Italy, you had these images of uh, uh, Russian planes landing with uh, um, containers of equipment, then what was inside actually uh, questionable, but uh, uh, the image, uh, the flag, even the im, um, uh, was, uh, uh, was a symbol of international solidarity that became an instrument of propaganda and of, of narrative uh, of some powers. Uh, there was a certain moment where in the north of Italy that was hit most, uh, you had uh, uh, Russian planes, Chinese planes, and Cuban uh, solidarity brigades coming to support the Italian hospitals in the north, which as you probably know, uh, is an area uh, where um, the extreme right uh, has some uh, um, some uh, popular um, uh, um, basis. Uh, so it was quite a weird, um, uh, it was a little bit the, the word upside down, let's put it this way. Uh, but then I think, uh, so in, I think that at that moment, we started to, uh, to realize that indeed, um, what was an opportunity for cooperation uh, in a world that's definitely needed to have cooperation on many different files and, and topics uh, had easily and, and quickly turned into uh, an element of competition of narratives and, uh, and even of ideological propaganda. Uh, and then I think happened something interesting for us Europeans, very interesting, uh, that after the few weeks and months of um, cacophonic reactions, and uh, um, obviously I would say this was normal because uh, nothing like that ever happened before, I think that the European Union and the member states managed to put together uh, an impressive um, package uh, for the recovery um, of, uh, of our economies that managed to go quickly, I have to say, uh, compared to what we could have uh, feared, uh, and uh, managed also to, I think, make Europeans understand that without that kind of safety net, without that kind of umbrella that brings us together uh, all uh, uh, the um, all the big numbers of us uh, makes it uh, convenient for us all uh, to be part of this economy of scale. Because in in this context, where to get vaccination, to get equipment, to uh, to get uh, uh, medical treatment, uh, but also to have money for your economy and and, and your health systems, by the way, uh, the um, being part of a bigger family uh, counted. And not being part of that big family uh, would have been a disadvantage for most of our citizens. So I think that this was uh, somehow an eye opener for most of the Europeans uh, in uh, in a positive manner. Now, obviously, we will need to see how this will uh, turn into concrete steps uh, that can be taken uh, on the implementation of, uh, of what lies ahead. But and this might be one element that we might discuss in the Q&A session, even if, again, this is not strictly related to my own field of expertise, this is not related to foreign policy, but it was the first time for me um, that I heard from American friends, not only American friends, uh, words of admiration for how the Europeans managed to react, especially on the economic side, but also in terms of solidarity in the treatment uh, of uh, um, the people in need, uh, when we saw um, citizens of the European Union member states transferred to hospitals of other member states, that was really a powerful moment. And the rest of the world, I think, looked at us thinking uh, they have the instruments that are needed to face this together 
uh, in a way that is advantageous for uh, all the citizens of the European Union. Uh, so this is, uh, this is on the positive side. How does this impact uh, foreign policy, international relations, and uh, uh, also the role of the European Union in the world? Well, I think that on one side, well, there is a very sorry, banal and basic element in which COVID has uh, and is impacting um, the, um, the international relations and the way in which foreign policy is done. And again, it, it's uh, you, you will forgive me for the banality of what I'm saying, but in foreign policy, it, ch it changes completely more than in other sectors of work of institutions. Uh, diplomacy uh, is based on uh, meetings, visits, personal gestures, the symbolism of a visit. Uh, in diplomacy counts more than uh, a thousand words. Uh, any foreign minister, any uh, head of state and government um, thinks uh, what would be the first visit abroad that he or she would have. Uh, who you receive or not um, is a symbol, is, is a, is a, has a meaning, and all of that is done. Uh, the visits on the ground, on the field, uh, it can be a refugee camp or, or a project that you finance somewhere uh, in, in, in a faraway place uh, uh, has, uh, again, comes together with a message. And uh, in foreign policy, this is much more relevant than in any other sector of our policy making. And this is done, as well as the personal contact of private conversations. Uh, how much can you trust Zoom, WebEx, Teams uh, for uh, uh, reserved conversations that sometimes diplomacy requires? Uh, I couldn't have uh, held uh, the negotiations on the Iran nuclear talks on on on, on Zoom uh, that would have been impossible not only for uh, for reasons related to uh, the need to uh, protect informations and interlocutors that obviously comes first. Well, you have, you might have seen that uh, during a defense ministerial meeting of the European Union, uh, a journalist managed to enter the the, the virtual room, uh, something that could have never happened with a physical room. Um, so. Uh, that obviously changes the nature of the conversations and of the decision making, but also because diplomacy and, and international relations in nature need and require an element of private trust. Uh, the, the informality of the exchanges, being it at the site of, the, of, of a conference or being it uh, uh, the informal parts of uh, uh, official visits, sometimes is the most relevant parts of, of the work that a diplomat does. And again, I have the impression that this has affected the state of the, the quality of the relations um, in, in a very deep manner, uh, not only for Europe, but for everybody. Again, I, I apologize for the banality of the consideration, but sometimes um, the, the material part of our work um, is, uh, uh, is an essential part also of the content and the outcome that we manage to produce. Uh, and then there's the... Uh, there's the uh, weaponization, I would say, of, uh, uh, of the sanitary situation. Uh, what we believed it would have been central is not central anymore, and what we uh, would have never imagined would have been strategic uh, or even related to security uh, is now evidently uh, strategic and related to security. Medical equipment, vaccine, research, uh, resources that national uh, authorities or European uh, bodies uh, allocate to research and medical equipment. Uh, one year ago, one year and a half ago, you would never have bet on the fact that how much of your uh, GDP is invested in research and, uh, uh, and health system would have been part of your uh, basic uh, survival uh, instruments or even of your diplomatic tools. Uh, the capacity you have to export a vaccine or a medical equipment is today probably uh, from a security and, and power struggle perspective more relevant than uh, you know, a nuclear arsenal um, because it's related to the vital uh, survival of your citizens. So the, the paradigm around which we have been organizing uh, the power politics of uh, this initial decades of the century, uh, I think has changed for good. Uh, and I guess I, I have the impression that from now on, uh, it will be more and more relevant uh, how much um, of the soft power of your health system and research system and medical uh, system uh, you have that will determine how powerful you are in the world. Uh, on this, Europe could be well-placed. Uh, but 
challenged, very much so. And so here, I think we'll we'll come into a into a I think a difficult moment of definition on whether uh, we manage to establish a cooperative uh, network uh, with others that can be world powers in this new uh, scenario uh, where uh, the most required uh, skills and uh, and arms are uh, are the ones related to the pandemic. And it's for now, but it's going to be, my guess, it's for now and it's going to be for the decades to come because I have the impression that we're going to see more of this in different forms in the, in the years to come. Um, but again, uh, we, I think we will have to define, the world we will need to define, whether uh, it tries to build a sort of cooperative network that manages to support and sustain global need for um, for cooperation to address this challenge uh, without being naive, knowing that there is an element of competition, uh, both on the economic and on the political side, uh, but knowing also that uh, if we enter the spiral of competition in this, in this field, we all lose. Or again, if we follow the track of, uh, um, yeah, of, of confrontation and competition. Now, here I would link uh, this uh, uh, with the, with the election of Biden in the United States, because I think that this has uh, definitely shifted the, the paradigm towards a more cooperative, tentative, more cooperative global uh, scene. Um, not to be given for granted, I believe, uh, because I think that uh, the main, uh, the intentions are for sure that of uh, um, re-establishing a cooperative uh, world order uh, and uh, an investment in multilateral uh, relations and organizations, starting from the United Nations and obviously uh, the World Health Organization. But on the other side, uh, I think that also um, for what concerns the US administration and America as such, there's no back to normal uh, that can be imagined uh, also there. I don't think that uh, um, also in that case, uh, we can uh, expect uh, that the four years of the Trump administration would put into brackets and, uh, um, and, and that we would see simply a restoration of the past uh, administrations. Uh, I think that something has changed forever uh, in, in the DNA, in the fabric of the American society uh, and even in the institutions. And I think that from now on, the US administration will have to focus much, much more on domestic issues um, that somehow the, the message of America first would obviously never be declined again by a Biden administration in America only, but for sure it will have to respond to the expectation of a, of a domestic audience that is used to now consider every single move of the administration in that optic, in that logic. Uh, what is it bringing to me? And I think that uh, we Europeans will have to learn on how to be, let's say, um, friends and brothers and sisters and, and cooperative and, and working uh, closely with our allies and friends across the Atlantic, but also keep a certain margin of uh, autonomy. Some refer to this as strategic autonomy um, because uh, there will be uh, choices or fields or interests, uh, being it economic or, or political or security related, that might require a certain element of uh, uh, independent judgment and action possibly. I think Europeans will always choose to go together uh, whenever possible. Uh, but I think that we have now uh, somehow made ours the, uh, the lesson that uh, uh, we also have to be able to, uh, as the chancellor would have put it, uh, uh, take our destiny into our hands. Uh, that was a powerful image of, um, of a Europe that uh, is used to lean on others uh, easily. And uh, I think we've learned the lesson that we are grown-ups. We have to take our own responsibilities and we cannot delegate um, our own decisions to anybody else. Um, so I think that this will stay somehow. And this in combination with the post-COVID era, uh, that will be somehow my, my assumption, my guess, unfortunately, uh, a relatively post-COVID era, because I think that we will still have to deal with uh, some forms of uh, um, violent and, uh, um, and, and transformed uh, uh, virus uh, and pandemic for some time. I think that this will shape uh, um, international relations in the world and European uh, approach to foreign relations uh, in, uh, in a way that uh, was unthinkable uh, just last year. 
Um, so again, uh, I think that's, and I would stop here so that we have enough time for, for the Q&A, uh, but I think that, and the conversation, because I'm interested also in, in, in listening to the views of our, uh, of our participants, but I think that uh, we will need to have a European uh, rethinking of the way in which we position ourselves uh, in, in the world uh, with a much less uh, naive, probably, approach uh, somehow transactional, uh, having learned that uh, we need to take care of our own interests and looking probably at uh, uh, a variety of, uh, uh, I would say, um, alliances and partnerships that could be um, somehow a variable geometry. There might be issues on which we partner closely with some uh, and others on which we partner closely with others. Uh, keeping the compass of uh, the transatlantic relation and and the European Union centrality, obviously. Well, I say obviously, but it's not always that obvious. Uh, and 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 do whatever it takes to use a, a sentence that was very popular uh, that was uh, used by uh, my now prime minister uh, when he was in Frankfurt still uh, to do whatever it takes to safeguard the, the 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 health, the safety, and the security and the prosperity economically uh, of our citizens in Europe. Thank you very much. Now it's it's really fascinating to listen to you. Uh, among other things, what impresses me is what you say about the the importance of visits indeed uh, in diplomacy. It's something one one forgets easily, something that has changed at the moment. Now, I, I think we should, of course, talk about the role of the EU in the world, and you have raised some key issues here. But I would like to get us started um, uh, talking a little bit about what you mentioned in the beginning. So how did uh, the EU react to the crisis and how did we all fare in the crisis? So what you described was that initially there was this, this lack of a common reaction. Of course, health policy is not a responsibility of the EU, but still, uh, I think we all share the impression that there was a kind of failure, not of the European institutions probably, but of all of us, of the member states. When the pandemic came, it seemed that everybody was looking, you know, was kind of shutting down borders uh, and, and um, uh, you know, looking internally. Uh, and there was a failure that became apparent when the Russian planes landed in, in Italy. Uh, I think everybody was aware. I remember this, of course, in the, in the news of my own country. And it was apparent to everyone that this was shameful. Uh, now, uh, it, it, my question is, uh, what does this mean? I mean, if the EU wants to play, and I think we can all agree it has to play a different role in the world, if the EU wants to play a different role in the world, what are the lessons from what happened there? And in addition, if we look at the current situation, there is a perception that the vaccines, yes, some of them have been invented and developed in Europe, and some things went well, but the the production of the vaccines, the rollout, seems to be the next failure. Uh, we are falling behind the US and the UK to a terrible extent, and there's a lot of critique uh, about how this has been managed. Uh, I think a lot of people agree it was good to, to, to organize this jointly, but it didn't work well. So we are falling behind, and we all know that falling behind has a terrible cost in terms of lives and also an economic cost. So, so my qu first question before we, we, we turn to the questions in the chat, which are accumulating, uh, would be you know, what are the lessons for the, the way in which we work together in Europe uh, from your perspective? I think, uh, um... I think in, indeed in the very first days and the very first weeks, uh, the, the feeling, um, I think all over Europe, but I can, I can for sure say from, from the perspective of, uh, of an Italian, um, that the very first uh, days were uh, giving us all, I think, a sense of uh, confusion, chaos, and uh, um, uh, uncoordinated and unorganized uh, reaction, uh, and also a sense of solitude. Um, that was probably accentuated by the nature of this virus, uh, a virus that tells you basically that the other is a danger. Um, I mean, this is not the topic of our conversation today, but what strikes me the most is that for the first time in our, well, in, for sure in our generation, in our generations, uh, the, the message uh, is uh, that uh, the other 
uh, whoever he or she is, the other is a danger. Uh, and this comes only after a few years um, after the terrorist attacks in Europe. Uh, and I was reflecting upon that uh, just in, in this last months. Uh, you know, for um, for someone that has grown up, uh, I have I have two daughters, uh, teenager time, uh, age, and uh, having grown up first with the terrorist attacks in, in Europe that made you think that if you are in a place that is too crowded, it might be, be dangerous because it might be a target of terrorists. Uh, and then after a few years, um, uh, having to interiorize the fact that you have to keep physical distance of one meter and a half with anybody else and that anybody else could make you die, uh, what kind of humanity are we going to have in the next 20, 30 years? Uh, we, are, we have generations that are interiorizing the fact that the, the link with society, the link with the others, are a dangerous thing to have. And at the end of the day, the safest thing to do is to stay uh, closed in your room or your house and, and, and watch TV or a computer. Uh, this is actually, sorry, I, I'm not here, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a, another course, but uh, I think that uh, we will need also as Europeans, because we have been uh, throughout history, I think we have been, uh, and I, no need for me to say this to, uh, to, to any uh, German audience, but we have been somehow the center of uh, uh, philosophy and reflection upon uh, uh, humanity and, and um, society. Uh, and this is actually what worries me the most. What kind of society, what kind of human beings are we going to have? Are we going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, in the post-COVID era? But this is again for another discussion. Uh, but. I think that this psychological element uh, that was there from the very beginning, very first weeks, the other is an enemy, the other is a danger, the other can make, can make me die tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's very personal, it's very private. Uh, also had an impact on the way in which we felt uh, isolated and lonely and, uh, and divided also among Europeans. Uh, in, that, in those days, uh, again, I, I have lived through the media in, in Italy, the dramatic um, aspects of those, those weeks. Uh, in those days, the, the normal thing to feel was uh, that the solidarity was really amongst small circles of those that understood exactly what we were feeling. And in Europe, I think that the basic, again, I'm, I'm saying something banal, but I think that the basic reason why the initial reaction was, uh, um, was disaggregated, was, was captured, was, was uncoordinated, was the, the very basic reality that the virus uh, was hitting some parts of Europe in one way and, uh, and not other parts of Europe. Uh, and so the perception of reality was completely different across Europe. And I can testimony of that, living in Belgium, uh, in, at this time of, of last year, mid-February, everything was fine. Everything was fine. <laughs> Uh, no problem at all. Uh, while well, you, you, you switch on a TV channel, uh, on the Italian TV channel, uh, and, and you see drama and, 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 you know, hundreds of people already, already there was the sense of, uh, of, uh, uh, of something big and, and uh, revolutionary somehow for bad. And, and this discrepancy on perception obviously led to a discrepancy in policy because policy is based on, uh, uh, on what you perceive to be the priority and the urgency. And if you don't feel the urgency and the priority, you don't take decisions. And so uh, the, the lack of common analysis, the lack of common experience in the very first weeks of the pandemics, I think led naturally to different approaches. Uh, and yes, uh, in Italy uh, in particular, I think there was a feeling of other countries not understanding fully what was happening in the beginning. Um, and, and, and taking decisions slowly, but understandably, because in those countries, uh, nothing similar was happening with the same kind of gravity. So I think that this is natural, this is human somehow. Uh, but maybe the lesson to be learned, uh, as, as you asked, so what can we learn from, from this in terms of decision making? Maybe the lesson to be learned here is to share, uh, to, to find mechanisms of sharing uh, information and analysis at a very early stage, to have a sort of functioning early warning system among European countries um, in place, not only for things on which we already have that in place, we already share intelligence, for instance, uh, to be improved, because I think this is one of the elements on which the European Union can improve a lot, 
uh, having a system of uh, sharing intelligence uh, uh, much more than we're doing today. Member states are obviously jealous about their, their intelligence, um, but it's counterproductive not to share. And we learned this through the terrorist attacks uh, that happened on European soil. And I think that we should share much, much, much more and much faster uh, also the analysis of other dynamics that happen in our territories with a certain level of trust among us. Uh, and that if one member state tells you or tells the others, look, this is serious and this is hitting hard, there should be more listening, I think. Um, there can be institutional mechanisms to ensure this. I think now they are in place. Um, but I think uh, it's a culture of uh, paying attention a little bit more to what the other member states um, tell you it's a priority for real, for their own perspective. Um, we, we tend to have, um, and this is not linked to any, inter any institutional mechanism, actually, this is a culture that we need to develop in the European Union, I believe, uh, a culture of paying attention uh, and, and trust what the other member states are telling you. Uh, I've seen many uh, council meetings, European councils, for the first councils, defense ministers. Um, I think you know the high representative is the one that sees the most because uh, he's involved in many formations of the council. Uh, and I've seen uh, I've seen that often the attitudes of the member states uh, reciprocal. Uh, there's not good ones and bad ones here. The reciprocal attitude of member states often is not the attitude of uh, finding the common good, but of winning your national point. Uh, I come with an agenda, I have to go back to my own constituency showing that I won that point, being it on financial decisions, being it on some policy. Well, foreign policy, actually, this is less the truth, because on, on foreign policy, normally we tend to understand that we are in this together. And we, uh, But uh, I think we should try to develop uh, an attitude of, uh, of mutual trust and mutual listening and understanding a bit more advanced than, than the one we had. On the vaccines, uh, I think that without common European approach, the situation would be even worse. That's my guess. It's not my field. I'm not an expert on that, so I couldn't share a particular insight. But as a citizen and as someone that has uh, seen the dynamics of international negotiations uh, a lot, uh, I have the impression that if it was not uh, an integrated European uh, uh, Union effort, uh, we would be in a worse place than uh, where we are now. And I, I can share with you this that for me was striking. Uh, even if now I'm in, out of office uh, uh, in the institutions uh, uh, since more than one year, um, and, and happily running a college, so uh, completely in a different environment, obviously always related to the European Union, but it's it's an academic. Uh, work. Um, still in this last month, I have received text messages uh, from uh, uh, foreign ministers of uh, non-European countries texting me to ask if I could help um, creating a connection with the European uh, authorities to facilitate the vaccine uh, for them, uh, for third countries. Uh, and not necessarily um, not necessarily countries that have, have little resources, uh, powerful countries, rich countries, uh, developed countries, uh, countries that have uh, very high scientific standards, but still that looked at the European Union as the gate through which uh, they could find access uh, more easily rather than alone. And, and again, this tells me that, uh, you know, I think that in, in Europe we would have been exactly in the same situation if we were not acting together. Uh, my, my, my favorite quote uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the one that says that uh, in, in Europe you don't have big and small countries, you only have countries that have not yet realized they are small. Um, and I think this is true also for, for access to vaccines, and, uh, and it will be for medical equipment and treatments when we will have that. Thank you. Let's uh, turn to the questions that have come in here from the audience. Uh, so here is Achim Krüger who asked, you raised the point, knowledge is power in the future world. And uh, more than ever, it's scientific, it's it's medical things. Uh, so uh, does this, what does this mean? Does this have implications with respect to EU, to, to EU budgets, national budgets, may, maybe for classical defense on the one hand, 
versus uh, these new questions, research, uh, development, on the other hand? I think uh, um, it's perfect. that's perfectly right. Uh, there are, I think, two uh, elements that will uh, uh, be, um, be uh, reviewed uh, from now on. Uh, one is the investments in research. Uh, scientific research, uh, medical research, uh, but also research in general terms and academia. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, this will have an impact on, uh, on uh, uh, European and national budgets. But the second element that I think, and it, would, it might be a bit more controversial politically, I think the second element uh, that is impossible now not to factor in any uh, political decision on budgets at national or European level is the one on uh, on the healthcare systems. Uh, you have seen uh, an initial reaction in Europe that has been more effective than in the United States, I think, because we have public health services that work. Uh, and this is quite uh, something peculiar to the European system. The welfare state we have uh, guarantees all our citizens access to high quality uh, health care, um, which is, again, unique in Europe, and uh, for a long time has been questioned. And I think uh, it is inimaginable to question this again in the future. So uh, again, this is uh, more of a national competence, obviously, than um, of the European competence. But I would expect also on the European level, uh, at least it would make a lot of sense, and it would sound logic to any European citizen, I think, uh, to have incentives uh, on the European level, to have more investments on the national level, on efficient and effective uh, healthcare systems in our countries. Thank, thank you. Here's a related question by Aldo Belloni. You mentioned strategic autonomy. Is this, in your opinion, part of the new European normal? And uh, now I've lost the question, excuse me. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, is Europe able to design and coordinate this uh, this strategic autonomy? And as an example here, Germany is struggling in getting a European consensus on energy autonomy uh, with respect to North Stream 2. Is this not a bad omen? I will not comment on North Stream 2. I, I managed not to do it when I was in office, and I will not do it. <laughs> and and I, I think there were good reasons for doing that. Um, so there are some, you know, there are some issues on which you work without uh, without commenting, and there are some issues on which you comment without necessarily working too much. Uh, that was one element on which I always try to work without commenting properly. Um, and I would keep this uh, this uh, line. Um, but uh, uh, strategic autonomy, I think, will need to be part of the new normal of the European Union and of Europeans. Um, for, as I said, for the combination of factors, the lessons that COVID has uh, told us, uh, but also the lessons that uh, the, the changes of US administration has told us. And that it's good to have friends, uh, but it's also good to make sure that you can survive if at a certain moment your friends take a different direction. Uh, you cannot be dependent uh, on, uh, well, you cannot, you should not be dependent on, on your competitors and for sure you, that, that is for sure. Um, and you should also avoid to be completely dependent on your friends because uh, uh, things might change even if temporarily. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's definitely true. Uh, I, th I, I think it is important to stress here uh, this uh, as, uh, uh, as this is uh, um, anyway, uh, um, a forum focusing on uh, economy. Uh, strategic autonomy is normally referred to in the field of security and, uh, and military. Uh, I strongly believe that our strategic autonomy uh, spans over a much broader um, uh, range of fields. Uh, I give you an example. One of the elements on which I have uh, seen myself, the lack of strategic autonomy, that Europe has uh, is, for instance, uh, the uh, difficulties we have had to defend economic interests, legitimate trade and economic interests uh, in Europe from the impact uh, of the extraterritorial effect of US sanctions. We have found out that we can be autonomous in defining what we consider legitimate. Uh, so we define the normative 
framework, but then we might find out that we are too exposed to the financial sector in the United States to be autonomous in the actions that are consequence to respond to that legal framework, to that normative framework. And so you can have autonomous norms, but you cannot have uh, players in certain sectors, take the banks or the big, uh, uh, the big companies, that would not follow those norms because it's not convenient for them uh, because of the links they have with another market or the use of currency. Uh, we are not using euro uh, for, for instance, uh, transactions when it comes to oil and gas. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so? We've always used the dollar. In the past a few years, this has been a problem. Um, and uh, I think that the next step of the, and, and to me, this applies to strategic autonomy. It's not only military, it's not only, uh, only security related. Um, well, it is somehow security related, <laughs> how you use your money. And, and for sure, I do not have to argue this to you. Uh, but uh, I think that the next frontier of how the European Union should, uh, should uh, uh, imagine uh, sovereignty and autonomy uh, is how to use its own financial assets better. Uh, again, not in a, in a confrontational manner with Washington or whatever, whoever, but simply uh, providing ourselves the instruments to uh, protect our economic interests or our financial interests if there is the need to do so. And we found out, I believe, that we do not have the appropriate tools to do it. This is not a foreign policy um, discussion. This is... Uh, uh, in the European Union, in the Commission, it's for sure for uh, uh, for uh, Dombrovskis more than for Borrell. Uh, but uh, I think it's a discussion to have. What do we do with our financial assets and, and, and instruments and our economic power? I couldn't agree more. I, I absolutely agree. So here is a nice question um, regarding the relations to our Russian friends by Rodion Mamatkanov. I, I read this uh, the way it's written. Hello, dear Mrs. Mogherini. Thank you for your lecture. I have some questions for you. First of all, what do you think uh, about probable certification of Sputnik 5 in the EU. Uh, I'm uh, not sure you, but, but maybe you have a view on that. Uh, secondly, how will the pandemic change EU-Russian relations? What do you think about the visit of Mr. Borrell in Russia? Thank you for your answers. <laughs> Uh, easy ones. <laughs> no, on, uh, I don't have any insight nor any specific uh, knowledge uh, or, or, you know, uh, I'm definitely not the most qualified person to comment on the quality of, of the vaccine. So I would definitely leave it for, for the experts. And I trust, I have full trust in the agency uh, that is uh, doing that work for the European Union to have uh, an objective and uh, scientific judgment. And this is, uh, this is it. There's no discussion about that. I, I am a strong believer in science. And uh, uh, as someone that has not a scientific uh, uh, background, uh, I'm a humanist and I understand very little of sciences, uh, which implies that I trust fully those that understand something in this. Uh, so I would never discuss uh, the content of any decision related to the vaccine. Uh, that we, we have professionals, we have scientists that do this, do this wonderfully well, and uh, we simply need to trust them uh, in the in the work they do and provide them the instruments they need, including the funds. Uh, this is it. Um, I, I would stop there. On relations with Russia, um, I don't know if COVID itself uh, would change in any way relations between the European Union and Russia or uh, among the different member states. Um, I, um, I think... I tend to think that this would not be a main element of, uh, of the equation uh, in, in how the relationship uh, uh, would evolve. Um, I think that the key elements there uh, would continue to be two, mainly. Uh, on one side, uh, the difficulties uh, that are today very similar to the ones that were there when I was in office, uh, divergences, very serious and profound divergences when it comes to situation in Ukraine, uh, but also in other countries, in Belarus, in, uh, in, uh, in some of our uh, Eastern partners, uh, uh, also the situation of uh, human rights and um, rule of law inside the Russian Federation itself. Um, but on the other side, so this, this would be the main, I think, one of the main elements um, that will continue to determine the state of re the relation, um, how far uh, we would manage to go uh, bilaterally uh, between the European Union and Russia on these two elements of profound disagreement and, and problem. Uh, 
Uh, and on the other side, um, the fields on which cooperation is desirable, needed, and in some cases is actually happening. Uh, I don't know if COVID would be one of those. I think it's too early to say now. Uh, but for instance, during my mandate, uh, we had identified um, uh, with the Russian blockers, with, with Lavrov, um, a series of issues on which cooperation was uh, uh, to be explored. And in some cases, we indeed cooperated uh, on some files, uh, trying to keep the clarity of messages both on the cooperative side and on uh, the side that was much more problematic. Uh, I think, well, I mentioned before the Iran nuclear deal, uh, cooperation with Russia on preserving the Iran nuclear deal alive, at least even if not in good shape, uh, was essential. And um, uh, cooperation with Russia, but also with China on that file was always key. Uh, without uh, Russia and China, the European Union would have not managed to keep that uh, agreement alive. Um, but also on some other issues related to foreign policy, namely on, on some of the foreign policy files. Uh, well, uh, I think that, for instance, uh, on the uh, what I normally refer to by now, uh, the uh, lack of Middle East peace process, that uh, uh, the, the future of, uh, of Palestine and, uh, and the status of Jerusalem, uh, for instance, Russia and the European Union uh, have always kept uh, uh, the same approach, that is the UN-based approach. Uh, these are just two examples of uh, possible cooperation that can continue and can be beneficial for the rest of the world and not only bilaterally. And I believe, for instance, now I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, uh, uh, with an academic environment um, and, and I director of the College of Europe, I see potential, for instance, for academic cooperation. Uh, for sure, people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, um, I was struck at a certain moment when I was still in office uh, in the EU institutions to see that the highest, um, the, the, the nationality um, that had the most uh, of uh, uh, beneficiaries from Erasmus Plus uh, was Russia, uh, meaning that the younger generation of Russians come to study in the European Union countries with subsidies from the European Union. And I think this is extremely positive uh, to have uh, students coming to study in Europe and possibly European Union students going to study in Russia. I think. These kind of elements uh, are uh, can be extremely beneficial, and possibly there can be also, I think, uh, other areas of cooperation uh, where, again, I think of some foreign policy uh, files on which, for sure, uh, there is the possibility of working more and better together. Uh, but I don't think that this uh, will uh, affect or will change the the the, the, the basic uh, element. Uh, of uh, profound disagreements uh, on uh, the two issues I mentioned before. Um, the state of uh, conflict uh, and, and tensions in Ukraine particularly, but also in other countries of the area, um, and uh, the state of uh, human rights and the rule of law uh, in, in the Russian Federation. Okay, can I raise a related issue? Uh, there is a debate about economic sanctions against Russia. A lot of German companies and companies in neighboring countries uh, are, have relations, a lot of relations to Russia. And there is this view saying, uh, okay, these sanctions are harming us, but they are not really helping uh, in, in achieving policy objectives. That's, that's the critique. Uh, so what's your view on the sanctions? You know, this was a um, this was a hard debate when I was a minister. Uh, being a minister of a country that has had, I would probably say, a lot of uh, economic and trade relations with Russia, uh, being a foreign minister of Italy in the moment when the sanctions were discussed was not the easiest of the exercises, as you can imagine. Um, and I perfectly remember uh, endless discussions we had uh, in the Foreign Affairs Council at that time. And you can, if you imagine the composition, if you remember the composition of that Foreign Affairs Council in, in those years, uh, 2014 in particular, uh, I was there representing Italy, but Germany was represented by Frank Walter Steinmeier, uh, Poland by Radek Sikorski, and Sweden by Karl Bildt. So you can imagine the, the, the level of, uh, of uh, discussion that we had uh, at the Council in those days. Uh, so very heated uh, uh, and principled discussions, taking into consideration exactly this. Uh, then the sanctions were adopted, and I think it was the right choice to make because uh, um, it was the strongest possible signal we can send, we could send, of unity first of all, of solidarity. I think with uh, with Ukraine, uh, with Ukraine people, 
um, together with the largest package that the European Union has mobilized for, for, for reforms in Ukraine. Uh, because at the end of the day, this is maybe one element that I would like to stress the most. Uh, I think that in the past, uh, the perception before 2014, uh, the perception of 2015 maybe, the perception was that the European Union was asking to our Eastern partners uh, a binary choice. You are with us or you are against us. You are with the European Union or you are with Russia. And I think that from that moment onwards, we changed narrative to say this is not choosing among or between different fields. This is developing a partnership that can be beneficial for the population of that country without cutting the ties that you can have culturally, economically, or, or even religious-based uh, with the Russian Federation, because history and geography don't change. Uh, but still, the two things could be compatible at the same time. You can be friends with more than one uh, at a time. And I think that this shift in narrative is healthy, uh, because at the end of the day, I think the perspective we should all aim at is that of having as we used to have before, a partnership with Russia, a strategic partnership with Russia. Russia was a strategic partner of the European Union and even of NATO uh, till 2014. So I think that the perspective should be in, in the midterm going back to that. But obviously, conditions need to be in place for that. Uh, but this to say, um, sanctions uh, were at the moment, I think, the right choice to, 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 to make, and they were kept over time. Uh, they, I think they have had an impact uh, for sure on some of the elements of the European economy. Uh, this is clear. I think they've had a, a strong impact on the Russian economy. Uh, I think the uh, connection between uh, how the Russian economy goes and how the political leadership behaves is not necessarily um, the one that we would have in the European Union. Let's put it this way. Um, because I think that the dynamics of power in Russia are different than the ones we have in uh, European countries. And I'm being very diplomatic, <laughs> but I think you, you understand what I mean. And so it, indeed, um, I think the question about uh, does the Russian leadership need to justify some choices to a constituency that is an economic constituency, for instance, is, the, is that in place? And so does the economic pressure has an impact, have an impact on the policy make? Question mark. I'm not sure. But that because of the nature of the Russian system. Thank you. That's fascinating. Now let's turn to China. There are a lot of issues raised about China in, in the chat. Um, I would suggest uh, to start with the COVID-related question that comes up here. So there is uh, the critique that maybe the virus was created in China. Um, that's certainly maybe a more exotic view. Uh, but uh, so, so, so created artificially. But there is this view that China was late in warning uh, about the virus. And can China be held responsible in any way? Uh, is that a meaningful approach? No, I'm a strong believer of uh, uh, multilateral uh, and transparent uh, processes and institutions. And I think that what is important at this stage, uh, without having any plotting uh, approach, uh, is that uh, uh, the World Health Organization has full access to anything that uh, is needed. Uh, for them to determine the origins of the of the pandemic, first of all, for scientific reasons, uh, to learn lessons that can be useful in the future. I think that it's very important in these circumstances to avoid uh, the, the the blame game, uh, because uh, we we are still in the middle of this, and even when we would be starting to get out of this in the next hopefully months, um, as I said, I. Hope I'm, I'm wrong, but I have the impression that we might have waves and cycles of uh, new viruses and new pandemics, hopefully of less intensity and, and, uh, uh, and uh, less dangerous than this. But I have the impression that we have to learn how to handle this kind of situations in the future uh, much more than we have had in the past. And this requires uh, scientific understanding of the first stages of, uh, of what happened. And this is why I say 
I, I, I'm not a scientist. I, I don't have elements to say uh, when and where and how the virus has started. Uh, if I if I were in that position, I would not be <laughs> here. I would probably have won the the, the Nobel Prize uh, last year on 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 the topic that on on a subject that is definitely not mine, uh, science and medicine. Um, so I'm no one to say um, to say uh, if, when, where, and uh, and how. What I can say is that uh, it is important that today, that now, uh, the experts uh, of the World Health Organization have full access to all informations that are needed, mainly, again, not to blame and shame, but mainly to learn the lessons and avoid that uh, mistakes can be done in the, in the future. Uh, we need to, I think we need to set up a protocol, uh, a procedure that can help the world wherever the next pandemic will start, and however it will start, to put in place a mechanism that protects the world much better than it was done before. But before, we had no protocol in place because it was the first time. So I think that we have to learn that lesson. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is a very German approach. I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> I have that approach myself. Uh, the important thing uh, is, uh, uh, is not so much to me the kind of threats you are facing. The, the, the main point is to have a procedure you can put in place to respond to that threat in an efficient manner so that everybody, every piece of the, of, of the chain, uh, every, um, every link of the chain knows exactly what to do in case of emergency, in case of risk. Uh, you have to put in, that is a military approach, but it, it, this is what we also need on a sanitary level. We need to, to have to make sure that uh, um, for the future, um, every single part of, of the mechanisms worldwide um, is in the condition of knowing exactly what to do, what information to share, how, with whom, with what consequences, uh, and, and in a way that we have a, a procedure to follow. Um, I, I, I'm a strong believer in procedures and protocols. <laughs> uh, I think they can save a lot of situations. So we have two more questions uh, about China here. The first one is, what do you think about the EU-China investment deal? Is it a blessing? Is it the opposite? Do you know the critique about the deal, the human rights, and so on? Yes, uh, this has been a, a deal that has been uh, negotiated for a very long time. Um, and uh, uh, it was the coincidence of the uh, timing of the end of the negotiations with the uh, with uh, yes, the Biden election and uh, uh, and also the COVID situation uh, is a coincidence in time, but uh, the, the the negotiations themselves were going on for long. And uh, actually, this has been something that the European Union has requested uh, to China uh, for a long time, uh, and there was quite some resistance on the Chinese side for a quite a long time. Uh, so um, I think the timing might have been uh, uh, questionable, and I think the communication might have been. Uh, um, handled better, baby. Uh, but um, again, it's not something that comes out of the blue. It's something that comes after, I would say, now I don't remember exactly how many years of negotiations, but uh, well, you know, the, the Chinese times, uh, it's definitely not a matter of months. Uh, for sure, this is something that was already in my, on my desk when I arrived in Brussels. And that was 2014. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not something that uh, improvised or, or out of the blue. It's something that on, on which... Uh, uh, not only the European institutions, but also the member states have been working a lot, uh, all of them included uh, in the trade uh, formation of the Council and even in the European Council itself. Uh, so again, uh, I will not enter into the judgment of the agreement itself, but uh, I would say that uh, uh, this, is, this has been a, a long-standing issue, uh, a long-standing negotiation. I don't remember any meeting I've ever had uh, with any of my Chinese counterparts uh, that was not mentioning also this agreement uh, to, to be uh, to, to be brought forward, and on the human rights uh, issue, you know, uh, the European Union uh, has always had a very strong and consistent approach. On that. Uh, not always all the member states. Uh, I'll be very frank on that. Uh, sometimes uh, I've experienced myself a situation where. Um, um, some member states feel more comfortable, to put it this way, to delegate to the European Union uh, to raise issues related to human rights uh, and then hide behind what the European Union has said and, and then do business. Uh, it's, it's more convenient um, from a national point of view. Uh, it's not effective, but it's more convenient. 
um, and, and this is not good. I think this uh, uh, this is something on which uh, member states should change approach because uh, the European Union, I mean, our interlocutors, this is true for China, but for other realities as well, our interlocutors understand it perfectly well when they see that uh, uh, there's a European Union demarche on, uh, on human rights and then the member states do other things. Uh, this uh, weakens the, the, the leverage that the European Union has. Uh, but uh, the European Union as such, and I have to say, the, majority, the vast majority of member states uh, has always been extremely consistent with China and human rights. And sometimes uh, we have been, um, we've been even the only ones raising some issues with China relating to human rights. Um, I have personally, every time I visited China, I think to my, to my memory, Every time I visited China during my mandate, I always had meetings with uh, human rights defenders and uh, civil society activists in Beijing. Um, never this was an issue. And again, I cannot speak for the European Union. I'm not representing anyone anymore, which is a relief. But uh, uh, I, um, I perfectly remember that in all our dialogues, uh, I always raised uh, very uncomfortable human rights issues, including some individual cases, uh, in a very open and candid manner, sometimes, uh, most of the times, including with the press in China. Uh, I perfectly remember press conferences uh, where I was raising this publicly, uh, being next to the Chinese uh, consular um, and foreign minister. I mean, this is, uh, this is something on which the European Union, I believe, would never, never, never um, give up or uh, be shy uh, because of any investment agreement side. Can I ask you in this, uh, I mean, that's fascinating in such a situation, would the Chinese minister just act if nothing, as if nothing had happened or what's your experience? Likely. Uh, yeah. No, I, I have to say, no, the private conversations, uh, uh, not the private conversations, the, the, the formal conversations, the meetings, uh, in the meetings, um, it depended very much on the issues raised. In some cases, uh, it was uh, um, acknowledging that we were raising the issue and not reacting too much. In other cases, it led to endless discussions, uh, very long and very much on content. Uh, and it could last for hours, <laughs> uh, a point on the agenda on human rights uh, uh, situation. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but but uh, don't be mistaken, in some cases, our interlocutors also had some points to raise with us on human rights related issues. During the migration crisis, during the refugee crisis, I had to face quite uh, a number of conversations uh, with interlocutors that didn't have a very good record on human rights, uh, arguing that we had work to do at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were right. Uh, human rights is never something that you can give for granted once and for all. It's work in progress. So I was always open personally. I, I always found it good to say, we have a conversation on human rights uh, also in Europe. I mean, it's okay. We're not teaching. We, we, we don't have, we're not in a situation where, or in a position where we can preach and teach. But as we are open to discuss our own uh, human rights issues, we want to discuss also others' um, human rights issues. And this was the case with China. This was the case with all, all countries with which we have uh, dialogues. Um, I would not name others specifically, but uh, you can easily um, uh, imagine. Uh, and the European Union has, and this is something very precious that we have, I think, uh, I think we are the only ones having uh, uh, dedicated human rights dialogues uh, with third countries, uh, where uh, it's uh, uh, where you have specific sessions with experts uh, dedicating one or two days uh, only uh, to discussing uh, human rights related issues, uh, covering different aspects from the judiciary to the media, everything, transparency, everything. Uh, and this happens normally uh, once a year or twice a year, um, respectively, in Brussels or in the countries involved. And I think this is an excellent instrument we have to have uh, candid, open, constructive conversations uh, on, on issues that are delicate. Uh, and uh, with, with the Chinese counterpart, uh, I always had uh, uh, real conversations about this. It was not, uh, it was not just uh, a facade. Obviously, then... It, when I raised it publicly, no, the, the, the reaction was, I was raising this publicly, but it was not, they were not commenting on their side. Uh, but I, already the fact of raising this publicly with the media uh, in the press conference in China was, to me, I think it is important because, you know, 
what I was saying about the symbolism of, of uh, foreign relations and, and international relations and diplomacy is also this, what you say in public uh, counts because it gives a message of importance, gives a message of support, those in that country that are fighting for some things. Uh, they're not alone, they're not abandoned, there's someone out there uh, that uh, um, keeps an eye on, on what happens and uh, this can prevent some situations to go even worse. And this is why, um, to, to, to tell you the truth, one of the most dramatic moments, at least in my mandate, was, uh, and, and I, I think I covered some years that were quite dramatic because, uh, uh, yeah, 2014, 2019 was, uh, uh, was uh, Brexit, uh, was uh, the Trump administration. It, it was a bumpy road. Uh, but to me, one of the most dramatic and sad moments was uh, when, uh, uh, the, at the time, Secretary of State Tillerson uh, publicly announced that the U.S. foreign policy would have not been based on human rights considerations anymore. And that sent immediately a message in the world that uh, human rights were not an issue anymore and that green light forever, including in China. And in that moment, it was the European Union and some others, I think Canada, I think Australia, some others, Japan in some cases, that were you know, insisting on the fact that, no, human rights are important elements. But we were left a bit alone in those years. Th thank you. Now we have more questions than time, uh, but so you have an obligation. I haven't forgotten that, just to, just to assure you that at 7.20 that you need to move on to another obligation. But I would very briefly like to raise two issues from the questions, and I would suggest I put them together and you choose what you want to answer. So one question here says, um, uh, I mean, we, we and we have discussed that, uh, unity, European unity, is important for the future. I think we can agree on that because otherwise we will have, will have a hard time addressing the challenges ahead. So which are, in your opinion, the most important and dangerous powers or issues jeopardizing that unity and jeopardizing that integration? Which are the factors that can divide us? Uh, uh, and and uh, I think understanding them as these threats is important. And then finally, I would I have to ask you about uh, the it the Italian situation, uh, which is not about foreign policy in this time, but you expected that. So uh, the, there is a new prime minister. We all know him very well. Uh, so uh, he has 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 put forward uh, an ambitious reform program. Uh, so what should we expect? I mean, expectations are very high. Uh, so uh, what are the challenges? Um, uh, what, what, what are the key issues? What, what are maybe factors uh, that threaten the success uh, of this reform agenda? Of course, we all want it to succeed, but maybe what are uh, the issues we should should keep in mind, please? I um, thank you for putting the two questions together because uh, al already in the press room, uh, I always uh, was joking with journalists, if you ask me two questions, you can, but then I can choose which one I answer to and drop the, the other one. Uh, so I would tend to do the same. No, on, on the Italian situation, I would not comment in details. I would just say that, well, you know Draghi well, uh, if there is one uh, safe, safe pair of hands in which... Uh, 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 in which the recovery plan and also the vaccination uh, plan uh, for, for Italy uh, can be, it's, it's his hands, uh, is probably the most reliable person, together with the President of the Republic, Mattella, uh, to, to face this difficult challenge, uh, both in terms of the sanitary needs, but also in terms of the economic and social recovery that the country needs. So um, full trust in him, I uh, couldn't think of anybody um, more uh, solid than him uh, to, to do this. Um, but indeed, uh, he, he doesn't have a, a, an easy task uh, uh, and an easy, uh, let's say, framework in which uh, this task needs to be accomplished. Uh, but he's used to challenges, so I'm sure that he will. I'm confident. I'm sure that he will manage. Uh, uh, he will manage uh, uh, and do his best. Um, and, and maybe uh, it, indirectly, uh, my my answer to the other question will also um, tell you something about uh, um, about this other question. I think that's the main uh, threat we have uh, in terms of unity of the European Union uh, is. Uh, um, is the domestic political tensions that we have inside our member states when it comes to, uh, in particular, the far right, 
Uh, many uh, describe this as populism uh, or anti-system. I, I, I like to call things with their names. I, I think we are talking here about, uh, in some cases, I'm not all, uh, in some cases we have anti-system movements, uh, and this is understandable. Uh, I think this comes uh, out of the sum of uh, um, multiple um, uh, multiple crises, uh, starting with the financial one, that has made many felt um, at risk or excluded. That is one thing. But then I think that's the main risk we are facing is the rise of uh, the potential rise of extreme right movements and parties uh, in our domestic um, national um, uh, political landscapes. Why? Well, I think this is, this is a risk and, and a threat for our societies as such. Not only our societies. Right? It's not on, as we've seen on Capitol Hill, this is not a purely European risk. Uh, I think it's a global trend that, uh, that that we need to look at very carefully. Um, I think it's a risk for our societies as such, but I think it's the main risk for European unity uh, as such, uh, because uh, the uh, implications of uh, a nationalistic extreme right political discourse uh, is uh, uh, the natural implications, the logic implications, uh, are uh, the um, would lead us to uh, divide uh, our continent again. Uh, at the end of the day, Europe was born uh, after the Second World War out of a simple reasoning, uh, simple but very courageous, uh, when mainly uh, well, our funding fathers and few mothers, still they were present, less visible but present, uh, and especially uh, in, in Germany and France, understood something extremely simple, but again, uh, extremely unpopular at the time, that making business together was more convenient than killing each other. Uh, at the end of the day, it all started with coal and steel, uh, something very, I mean, not really romantic or idealistic. It was really an element of investing together uh, in order to share so much of an interest that it would have become impossible to kill each other because we would have lost too much. No. Very basic. Uh, well, the roots of... Um, the seeds of uh, extreme right nationalism can lead us backwards to think that, and, and we've seen some of this thinking with COVID-related uh, discussions already, that thinking that you have to think to your own people first uh, in contrast to uh, understanding that you can serve your people's interests better if you do it with other Europeans. But if you start seeing your fellow European as a, uh, as a competitor, or as, uh, uh, as someone that doesn't really relate to you, uh, you know, yes, the European Union is a solid uh, functioning uh, experiment of political integration, uh, but 70 years is nothing in history. And uh, I think we might uh, risk to give something for granted without uh, understanding that we risk of losing something. Uh, and if, if you can imagine the economic consequences of a disruption of the European Union, oof, well, you know better than me, uh, it would definitely be a disaster uh, for every Europe. So I think w what worries me the most is not the divergences of political, uh, uh, you know, of, it's not the divergences of, uh, um, you know, uh, um, the approach on the budget, the economy, the foreign policy. Um, what worries me the most is the risk that uh, if extreme right uh, nationalistic movements race uh, in our individual countries, in our individual member states, it would be unsustainable to build a common European agenda uh, in, in the European Union. Because in that, the European Union is what you make of it. It doesn't exist without Europeans. And so if Europeans enter into a logic of nationalism, then the European Union could easily be disrupted. Uh, and this, I think, would be the biggest disaster we could face in our generation, worse than COVID. Um, because we wouldn't have then the instruments to react to the crisis we will face and we will have to face. So again, this is what worries me the most in terms of perspectives of, uh, of uh, the European uh, uh, integration process. And I know that this is a, a, a real possibility in all of our countries. Uh, so I think that this is uh, what uh, we should, uh, if we care about uh, the European Union and the European integration, this is what we should watch out uh, for the most.
Thank you. I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that maybe the biggest threat is not from the outside, but uh, from from within. I think that's very fair to say. And of course, you know, making trade rather than engaging in conflicts is music, as you say, in the ears of the economists. So I'm very grateful for that. But it all started like that. So yeah, we, we owe a lot to, to, to that. You're right. So thank you very much for these. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a wonderful. It's been an outstanding lecture. Uh, it's been very interactive. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise and, and your tremendous experience in foreign policy with us. I think this mixture is really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank the audience, of course, all of you for participating, for staying with us, all of those who organized this. And uh, I'm left with uh, announcing uh, the next Munich Economic make a debate. Uh, we have a panel at the next debate on the 1st of March, uh, and uh, it will be a panel of uh, three very successful women, uh, Janina Kugel uh, from, from Boston Consulting Group, previously Siemens, uh, Monika Schnitzer, professor here at the University of Munich, and um, Michel Tertilt, a professor at the University of Mannheim. Uh, and uh, the title uh, is uh, Catalyst or Break on Careers, uh, How Does the Corona Crisis Change uh, the World of Work for Women? Uh, so, I might join. I might join. Uh, <laughs> it would be very interesting so to, hear, to hear that. <laughs> you're so welcome, Federica. So I hope all of you will join. But for today, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, thank you, Professor Magorini, uh, for, again, for, for being with us tonight. Uh, stay healthy, uh, and I hope to see you soon on the 1st of March or, or whenever. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>